When words and the design can work together, it can be a really powerful way to express your personality. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I hope you're all well. Um, today, I had the grand pleasure of speaking with Nikita Morel, who is an architect-only copywriter and the founder of the Architects Workshop. So Nikita helps architects communicate their value. So Nikita helps architects communicate their value so they can get a steady stream of ridiculously good projects. Her mission is to make architecture websites sound less robotic and much more human. She has studied a whopping 663 architecture websites. You can see the results on her website. And she regularly sends emails packed with free copywriting advice, templates, anecdotes, stories on how to use words in a compelling way to win work. And in today's conversation, we cover a lot of these topics. Um, we talk about how clarity always trumps creativity when it comes to words, meaning and copywriting. Uh, we discuss why copywriting can really make the big difference in winning work with your prospective ideal clients. And we also discuss how copywriting can play uh, a very important role in increasing your credibility with target clients. Now, Nikita drops loads of enormous value and golden nuggets here. If you want to learn more or work with her more closely, all of her information is in the info of this podcast. So sit back, relax and enjoy Nikita Morel. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Nikita, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. The, your second time. It's the second time, isn't it? Yes, correct. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. No, brilliant to be back in the conversation with you. Um, you are one of the leading um, architect, marketers, architect, marketing, copywriting, mentors, coaches, gurus, if you like. You've developed quite an incredible niche, at really digging deep with practices to help them write about themselves, particularly like for online marketing collateral, how to express their identity, how to talk about their projects in a compelling way, uh, and particularly in a client-friendly way that actually resonates and can actually lead to more work as opposed to confuse and repel, um, has, which has been uh, a, a kind of industry trait that's happened for many, many years. So welcome to the show. Absolute pleasure um, to be here with you again. I guess the first question is, before we kind of launch into our main topic today, where we're going to kind of start looking at you know, what is copywriting in, sen in the sense of on a website and what should architects be doing? How do you describe what it is that you do when you're talking to an architect, for example? Sure. So I, um, I'm now, my title, I, I call myself um, a copywriter for, for architects. So I only work with architects um, at this point um, and only doing copywriting. So um, parked a little bit of the marketing and just focusing and going deep on words. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I, I guess, explain to clients, I say copywriting, it's not design journalism. It's not design writing. It's not editing what it is, is it's copywriting. So it's an art and a science and it's very much underpinned by sales, psychology and marketing um, and just client behaviour. Um, so, yeah, it's almost like every word matters. And I always tell architects, just like every line matters or every you know line matters on your blueprint, every word matters. So as you and I both know, architects tend to be visual creatures. So I'm on a bit of a mission to help architects with their words. And to show the Amazing. importance of words. 
yeah well it, it's it's really interesting because i often find and was very much guilty of this myself in my kind of beginnings of learning about marketing of how underused used copy is in architecture and so architects will come from a background of like beautiful big image single word for example because it looks great it looks great on a piece of paper um but actually in the world of marketing like copy that's like this is like one of the biggest ingredients for raising your fees for um selling more product um a compelling headline in a in, you know on a direct response piece of marketing can really make all the difference or on an instagram ad or online campaign the words are absolutely everything um so so for, from from your perspective um what, why is copy so important? Well, copy is, in essence, it's getting people to take action with your words. So you're writing to get them to do something, whether it's pick up the call and get a consultation, whether it's to sign up to your newsletter, whether it's even just to build trust. Um, so it's there to take action. And that's where it kind of differs from design writing in that. Um, and I guess in terms of copywriting in the world of architecture, um, I always say it's there to help you get a steady flow of your ideal clients um, or ideal projects. So it's there um, in a way to, you know, I don't want to it sounds salesy, but really what it's doing is it's prompting people to take action. So yeah, they hopefully become um, your clients. So everything I do in terms of website copy or that, it's always with that ideal client in mind. And I might refer to ideal client a lot in this conversation. And what I mean by that is just the type of client um, an architect wants to clone. So the one they've loved working with, they want to keep working with. Um, so yeah, when I refer to ideal client, that's that's what I mean. Okay, so the the copy on a website is talking to this specific person, if you like, and is designed in a way to have them pick up the phone, give you a call, give you money, essentially, not to be so crude, but eventually that's the that's what we're looking at. Exactly. And there's steps before that. Um, there's also just building trust, which is a huge thing, you know, people are giving a lot of their money or they're you know, trying to meet their goals um, when they hire you. So there's a lot of trust that needs to be formed as well as um, a bit of familiarity, you know, just having that kind of sense of an emotional connection with someone. And especially in today's world, the chances of you meeting every architect, you know, one-on-one face-to-face, you know, gone are those days, you've probably got 20 tabs open um, if you're doing your re- in your research phase and you're just comparing um, just by the words and visuals on their website. So that's what people are going by. So architects there are a few that still come up to me and say well Nikita all my clients are coming through word of mouth and referrals I don't know if I really need words I don't really know if I need a website and I tell them you know even your referrals are googling you everyone's googling you you're probably googling you you know so um, (laughs) it's 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 the yeah just the way we are and the world works now so and and uh, what what role then um or what let's, let's rewind a bit what are the pitfalls then when, when as an architect practice, we're set with the task of rewriting our website? What are some of the kind of common pitfalls or words of caution, if you like, that you'll often see people falling into? Sure, it's a great question. So I think, um, number one, it's really going back to the idea of that ideal client. So A lot of architects don't really write with their ideal client in mind. They tend to be a little bit, um, without sounding rude, but they tend to be be a little bit me-centric. So it's kind of like, we've won awards, we've done this, we've done that. Um, And it's all about flipping it. So instead of saying, we're so amazing, it's saying, your project is going to be so amazing when you work with us. So it's a, it's a subtle a subtle flip, but it's really keeping that ideal client in mind and thinking about their pain points. You know, what is it that they want? Why are they perhaps scared to hire an architect? Um, you know, are they scared that the architect's going to railroad their design? Getting those fees, getting those problems and challenges, and then addressing them head on in your copy. Um, and yeah, I think that's, it's just about 
thinking of the time, you know, we all get on a website and questions are running through our heads. You know, can we trust these guys? Are they expensive? Can they, have they worked on projects like mine before? So that's where your words come in. And not only copy, but copy also extends to social proof, so testimonials. Um, so that's, a, that's one big thing. And then also number two, going back to ideal clients again, is a lot of architects try and get their copy to speak to everyone. So perhaps mm. they're running a practice where they're doing residential and a bit of commercial. Um, the same message is not going to land for both audiences. So I always think of it like you've got two targets, and one arrow. You're not going to be get, able to get that one arrow on both targets. So a, a boutique property developer has very different needs um, and what they want from an architect is very different from a um, residential homeowner. And, and right. that, I guess, brings me to kind of my final pitfall is that a lot of architects don't really um, identify and understand their client's awareness level. And by that, I mean they're not really thinking about, well, hang on, is my ideal client low awareness? Have they maybe perhaps never worked with an architect before? So they have no idea what an architect does. They don't know why a drafts person is, you know, maybe not a, a great option compared to an architect. Um, but then, then you've got your high awareness clients, which perhaps are these property developers who have worked with heaps of architects before. And they're at the stage where they're just really comparing which architect is best for this project. So that awareness level um, is very important to understand when we're writing messages on our website too. So, so how do we go about and define who our ideal client is? What's that kind of process? And what do we do if we, if we come up that we've got this whole, you know, we've got a whole platter of different ideal clients that we might need quite different messaging or different ways to be communicated with? That's it. So I usually say three things. You want to make sure you, so passion, so you actually enjoy working with these types of clients because you okay. need that. Um, proficiency, you've got the skills to work with these types of clients. Um, and then number three, which often is not spoken about in the world of architecture, but is profit potential. You know, do these clients have the budget? Do they have the money? And you know, are they willing to invest in it? So it's kind of where those three things overlap. And again, that's why it sounds very simple. But if you just think of a type of client, um, you know, and I guess I'm assuming that you've got an established practice, but even if you're just starting out your practice, you just think of that type of client you want to work with over and over again. Um, that's kind of where I would start. And then um, I'm sure, you know, if you've done or heard of you know, client avatars or client profiling, that's when you can kind of get into that deeper layer. But a lot of, you know, architects always ask me, yeah, but Nikita, how am I going to find out their awareness level? And like, how do I find out this information about ideal clients? And really, unfortunately, um, the, the best way to do it is to ask them. So if you've got a client that you've built some rapport, you know, take them out for a coffee or a drink and just say, look, this is what I'm doing. Do you mind? just if I can borrow an hour of your time. And a lot of them, you know, are quite obliging, but it's really just having those conversations and saying, I want to get more clients like you. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that's quite, you know, if anyone said that to me, I'd be like, okay, sure, yes. You know, you enjoyed working with me, this is how. So that's one way is asking. Another way of getting more information about your ideal client is going back through your past clients, finding that one you really like and looking at past emails, seeing the types of questions they were asking or noting down, you know, perhaps in meetings, the types of, fears they were having and concerns they were having. Um, and sure, like, you know, the longer you are running your practice, you'll start to see themes emerge and you'll start to see the similar types of questions come up. And that's when you can start writing them down and saying, well, okay, in my website or on my website, I'm going to make sure that I address all these things. Um, yeah. So, so this is, a, this is quite interesting what you're saying as well about is the awareness level of a, a client, um, you know, uh, i.e. how sophisticated or unsophisticated they are perhaps in terms of working with an architect. And if we've got a, an architect and they're, they're working with residential clients and they're realizing that perhaps their ideal clients are going to have a low level of awareness of working with an architect, what does that mean in terms of how they're going to start structuring their, their, their copy? Yeah, sure. So that's when you need to have um, a lot of education. So that's when you have to be educating them, like zooming out a little bit and saying, well, this is what an architect does. This is what we can deliver. If we work together, 
this is what's expected of you and this is what's expected of me because they have no idea how this process works. You know, maybe they've had a friend who's hired an architect and they've heard it's a good idea, but they're not sure. So that it's a lot of education and rather than really focusing um, on who you are and what you do, it's like, well, this is what architects do and as an architecture firm, this is what we can do for you. So yeah, that's, it's more around there. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, if you've got a really sophisticated kind of ideal client, that's when they're really comparing you with two firms, you need to put forward a case as to why you are the best option for them. So that's where you might go into a bit more detail about your firm, your fee structuring, um, how responsive you are, getting into more of that nitty gritty, because then they're going, oh, okay, well, this is, yeah, they, they already understand what an architect does, they've worked with them. So they need to take that next step. So, so, so it's, it's quite interesting that there's, I mean, I, in my experience, I've often seen a, a, an interesting trait with many architects where if I ask them who is their ideal client and particularly like a really sort of design-led focus, they'll often say, oh, well, our ideal client is an artist or another designer. Because basically it's it's wanting to not have to educate the other person or find someone who's got the that appreciation um, of of design already um, like so what happens if, if you're if you're working with a, an architect and they're coming up with ideal clients like that how do you start to help them craft messaging or is that slightly unrealistic or what's the prognosis? Yeah, so look, there's really two things going on. Like, we number one, you can have um, an ideal client who respects and values and appreciates design, but is mm -hmm. not a designer themselves. You know, perhaps someone like me. You know, I'm not an architect, but I, I really respect and value design. So you may be perhaps um, going for someone like that. Um, and then the second thing really is once you've identified that, um, you call it out and perhaps then, so what I mean by that is you say, um, on your about page, for example, we like working with open-minded people or open-minded professionals that uh, respect and value good design. So you're very, instead of tiptoeing around the bush, I'm all for kind of calling things out because then you're filtering out your clients and you're saving yourself time. Instead of getting all these inquiries from people who are not a good fit, you're saying, well, mm -hmm. this is who we like to work with. You know, you're, you're, you're putting, out, putting it out there. Um, so, yeah, I think, look, a lot of people do revert back to the, oh, we want to work with artists and designers. But again, let's go back to um, the three kind of uh, passion, proficiency and profit. We need to make sure those three things are met um, and then, yeah, go those levels deeper. So, okay, fine. Maybe is it that they're creative rather than an artist or they've got those traits that don't have to be of that vocation? Great. So on a, on a website then, what are... What, what are the kinds of writing that we should be having? If, it, if it's not going to be about us, then what, what sorts of things do we need to have on the website? What kind of text, what kind of um, bodies of writing makes a good website? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll run through that, but I think just one thing to preface it with is when I highly, highly recommend um, architects write directly to their ideal client so a lot of architects have their on their website our clients or we service our clients or we make sure that our clients have a great experience if you can replace that clients with you we want to have lots of the word you in your website so speak directly because what that, that's doing from a copywriting perspective is breaking down that wall um, and immediately you're forming a greater connection with that person because you're saying well i see you i understand you i hear you um and i'm here for you kind of. uh so i recommend that and then in terms of the bodies of text um there's a lot of I guess back and forth between a static home page and a scrolling home page. Um, I much prefer the scrolling um, home page, and for the reason being that it helps that kind of story unravel. People are also now getting programmed to scroll. You know, we're scrolling on our phones and iPads or whatever. So um, I always say a nice hero image um, up the top with a tagline. That tagline is there to hook your ideal client. It's there to um, you know emote and really create that emotional connection. Then a subheading saying, you know, what is it that you do and what value do you offer? 
you know, are you a residential firm for growing families who um, are ready to take the next chapter or whatever it is? Um, and it's really important somewhere, and this is so obvious, but it's something that's missed all the time, that somewhere on that above the fold, and by that I mean before you start scrolling, is the word architecture or that you're an architect. Um, a lot of designs, you know, it's called XYZ Design Studio and then there's no word architecture anywhere. There's just a nice image. There's no, you know, their logo is a bit abstract as well. Um, but you need to tell people, you know, within the first I think it was eight to ten seconds that they are in the right place, that yeah. you are an architecture firm and that you can help them. Um, so then you've got your scrolling homepage, which I kind of see, you know, those um those tourist hop on, hop off buses. I yes. like to think of them like that. So you're on the bus, you see something you like, you hop off, you take a look, maybe it's the about page, but you come back onto the home page and you hop mm -hmm. off. So I like to kind of yeah, it's a bit of an analogy. I, I like no, to I love it. think of it because that's what your home page is. It's your home base. There's a reason it's called your home page. So you want people to, and then right at the end, um, you want them to take action. Um, and that's why throughout your whole website, it's really important that on every single page, whether it's your about page, your bio, your project pages, you have a strong call to action. And by that, I mean, you're saying, um, you know, if you would like to bounce around ideas or whether you're ready to hire an architect, we're here for you, get in touch or book your consultation or whatever it is. Um, but that needs to be on every single page. And I think that's something architects often miss as well. Great. Now, going back to some of these things that you were you were mentioning here, I, that, I think I find that really fascinating, like, you know, the kind of being really didactic of, like, we are architects, here is what we do, something instantly recognisable, rather than a kind of cryptic, you know, we can get very creative with our um, namings and practices, and it becomes very subverted and cryptic, and, you know, almost like a puzzle that you've got to try and solve of what is this company doing. Um, let's talk about the tagline for a moment, because this is something that can it, it can be quite unassuming, but also incredibly important. What what makes a good tagline? Is there a formula for coming up with a good tagline? Yeah, there's lots of different templates, and I've actually got something on my website where it's just all the different templates you can plug it in. Especially nowadays with our AI and ChatGPT, it's a it's mm -hmm. a good thing to be able to have those templates. You know, for example, it could be we do X for Y by Z, you know, by doing this, this, and this. So okay. it could be as simple as that. Um, but really when it comes to your tagline, clarity trumps creativity any day. So it's really about being clear. Use your hero tagline to create emotion if you want to throw in a bit of creativity in there. But that tagline, so that subheading that sits below the tagline is all about just kind of what, where, and how. Um and who, sorry. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Clarity trumps creativity. Yes, 100%. I just see, and I know architects, you guys are, you're very creative. And I think sometimes it's about dialing that down and just saying, okay, well, wait, what's the message here? Mm -hmm. um, and that goes for across your whole website. I think, I don't know, I might get a bit in trouble for saying this, but sometimes um, I find architects hide behind jargon a little bit. They don't actually mm -hmm. know what they're trying to say. So they just think if I throw in a few big words, then it will sound smart and, you know, done and dusted. Whereas you have to just kind of be like, well, what is that message? What is that one thing you want to be saying and standing for? How do you, how do you advise um, architects then to kind of the, the writing for a client versus the want to talk about yourself and the kind of the, the sort of creative impetus of like, you know, there's, there's a balance, right, in terms of you, you need to make sure that the message that you're creating feels authentic for you as well, I'm, I'm yes. going to assume here. How, how do you make sure that, that it's like it's like an authentic voice that's coming through and not a voice that's – or is that a problem if it's a voice that is just purely for the client? Yes, there's lots of different um, voice types, and it's uh, it's a good – uh, very timely because I'm actually doing, um, I'm studying how to write in different voices at the moment because I think it's a, it's a big area that architects can also um, embrace. But 
there are different voices um, in that, you know, for example, there's um, friend at a bar. Uh, so that might be more conversational and you're just talking to a friend like you in the bar. Um, and then there's another one that is parent, which is more like guiding the client through um, just as a parent would do, you know, earning their trust and teaching them along the way. So there's all these different, there's nine of them and there's nine different voice types. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really, I find the the best way to do it and an easy kind of, well, not easy, but a bit of a trick is just to turn on um, voice type uh, voice, what is it? In, in Google Docs, there's um, a type voice to type tool or something like that. Oh, yeah, um, the kind of dictation tool. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Um, so I just turn that on and I think architects, perhaps you're better at talking about your practice um, and talking about what your ideal clients want. So I would always just start there and just have a conversation um, to your computer and just let that kind of dictate. Um, and then at least you've got something to go off. Um, mm -hmm. Start off by just talking about the things that your clients are always asking you or the problems are always coming up with or um, just common themes and trends and then kind of just talk about how you approach that or you solve that or, um, yeah, so, for example, if, yeah, clients are scared that you're going to always be railroading the design or you've got a bit of an ego, for example, then you can counteract that and say, you know, we leave our egos at the door with our muddy boots and bicycles or, you know, whatever it is, you can think of ways, um, creative ways to say that we don't have egos or we really listen. Um, you know, architects love to say we listen. Um, how can you say that in a different way? Or how can you use social proof, you know, testimonials that say where well, someone else has said, oh, they really listen. Um, so, yeah. Great. So, we mentioned we were talking earlier before we started about this idea of personality coming through in in writing. What 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 do you mean by that? And and how can we ensure that that's something that's that's happening? And I, and I, again, I kind of go back to what you were saying earlier about writing directly to the client. I mean, I can already see, you know, that is already a lot more engaging and interesting and i'm sure you have a take as well on on kind of writing in the third person versus writing in the first person which you know that also brings a very different feel about on a with text on a page yes yeah so with personality um it is again it's it's putting in a bit of you into the copy so i know it kind of counteracts everything i've been saying about being about the client but Personality, um, a, a big part of it is that voice. You know, it's how you sound. You know, when anyone reads something, there's a voice in your head that you, you're hearing it. So it's, for example, the cadence of your copy. You know, how short and punchy is it? Or is it a bit more poetic where it's long and long sentences and it's got a bit more descriptors and adjectives? You know, so that's kind of how the personality comes about in conjunction with, of course, your images. Um, and I've, you know, we've been talking a lot about words, but your design um, in the world of websites especially comes into play a lot. Um, and when words and um, the design can work together, it can be a really powerful way to express your personality. For example, there's um, a great firm here in Australia. They're in Newcastle. They're called SDA Architects, and they have great website biography section where they've really um, let the personality of each person um, shine and then the graphics they've got little graphs you know showing whether someone's a coffee or a tea drinker or whatever it is but it's it just works really hand in hand so with personality the whole reason I guess we do it is number one um, you know for memorability people are going to remember you if they remember your personality rather than just being another architecture firm um, and this is really important as you know, like in the world of design where the sales cycle is so long, you need to be top of mind. You need to be memorable. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's just setting you apart from all your other competitors out there. You know, if you have a personality, people already leaning in and going, cool, like these people seem like really nice to work with. Um, and likability is a big thing, especially in the types of projects you're doing. You're working with people sometimes for years, so you want to be liking them. You don't want to work with jerks, right? So... Um, yeah, absolutely. That personality, it, it helps. You know, someone might fall in love with your personality and think, okay, well, no matter what they're going to charge, I have to work with these guys. I'll make it work. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so is there 
space then or, or how do you suggest or direct architects to be talking about their own work or is this something that actually it's not so important these days to be talking about your own work but rather we're kind of guiding a client through what their process is going to be like and educating them or is there you know is it, is it still important to have portfolio and to be talking about your own work and if, the, if it is how do we talk about our own work yeah, a hundred percent. It's very important um, that you talk about your own work, but I think also it's just, again, it's the channel, it's the medium, it's your ideal client, but it's also that goal. You know, if you want to get more of those ideal clients, then with your project portfolio, rather than talking about the or focusing on all the intricate details of a project, what I recommend is that you take a step back and um, say, here's our design thinking. This is how we solve problems. You know, showcase how you approach a project um, because then a prospective client reading that will be thinking, oh, okay, I love the way these guys work. I want to work with them. So if your goal is to get better clients and to get better projects, um, and in the world of copywriting, that's that's usually the aim is to make those sales. Mm -hmm. um, then instead of, yeah, focusing on all that, just and with your project portfolio, I always recommend you don't have to have these beautifully written paragraphs. You can just have subheadings. You know, here was the client brief or what the client wanted, how we solved it, you know, three key design features and challenges you overcame. You know, be honest, and that can be part of your personality as well, saying, well, this is actually what went wrong, um, but this is how we overcame those challenges as well. Um, and always, always try and have a client testimonial, if possible, on those project portfolio pages as well. Is there still space for things like an about page or a bio? Yeah, do we still so, need to kind of talk about, about the practice itself and, and how, do, how do we structure those sorts of pages? 100%. So we'll start, we've got your home page, which I hopefully would be scrolling. Then you've got your about page. Um, and on the about page, I would just have, um, you definitely have to have a image of your team or um, so your about page is about your practice so about your firm um, and I often recommend on that about page having your values or even just like a little manifesto as to what you believe in uh, yeah. we believe statements are really strong um, and I highly recommend a we believe statement um, you could even use it for your tagline you know we believe in xyz you can't get more emotionally loaded than that um, and then you're of course attracting the people who say oh yeah i believe in that too um so yeah so you've got home page about page then you've got your biographies um or your biography you might even want to throw in a backstory there you know kind of what was the origin of your practice why did you even start it was it that you were frustrated with something that was happening in the industry was it that you've always kind of had that kind of entrepreneurial you know what is it um then a services and a processes page um, mm -hmm. which outlines, you know, what is it that you actually offer and how do you do it? And I think that's a huge missed opportunity on architecture websites is the how. You know, it doesn't have to be a detailed stage by stage, but even just a really nice visual diagram um, of how. And then at the end, um, your work, so your project portfolio um, and your contact page. So it doesn't have to be in that order. Um, on your navigation bar, but there I would suggest um, the main pages. But um, I've seen some really creative things like um, I just stumbled upon a, a firm called Nine Yards Design and they've got a secret design bunker on their website where they put <laughs> non-architecture projects, but you just kind of go, what is this? So just little, I think sometimes adding little kind of, I call them Easter eggs, like little surprises um, are helpful too. I've got one on my website footer that says, enter at your own risk and you click it and you go into this kind of, it's called the Archie speak dungeon. And yeah, so it's like, again, letting your personality shine and getting a bit creative. How, how important is it to tell those kinds of um, off topic stories, if you like, or the things that might not be expected? Like I know, for example, you are interested in some kind of Japanese printmaking, is it, or tapestry? Yes, yeah, so I weave yeah, on a you Japanese weave. ball loom. Yeah, good memory. <laughs> and, 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 but, but, but that's really interesting because I remember seeing something about that somewhere and I was like, whoa, 
That's so yeah. cool. That's so interesting. Are those things, you know, is that just because that's like me and my architect brain that's just kind of gone, oh, that's something really interesting? Or are, are those kind of things we can craft them for um, our certain audiences? And are they kind of useful things to be sharing? Yes, like it's such a great point, 100%. Um, on your website bio, I always recommend having, you know, the last couple of sentences or it could even be a list on the side of things you like to do outside of architecture. And it doesn't have to be a hobby as such. It could just be that you're a dad or a mom or, um, mm -hmm. you know, you enjoy bushwalking or whatever it is. The reason to have those things is, number one, it kind of humanizes you. Um, it, mm -hmm. it makes you, you know, more of a human. Um, but number two, again, those connections. You know, if you state your favorite football team um, and then you've got an ideal client who is, you know, either that is not theirs or um, it is, you know, it's, it's a point of conversation. So if you haven't met them, haven't spoken to them, you think, oh, okay. Yeah, and you kind of get a better idea of what someone's like when you hear about the stuff they're doing outside of work. Um, Again, it shows their creativity or it could show that they're really active or, yeah. Yeah, but website bios are a great place to put that kind of information. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, the, the kind of, we've decided on an ideal avatar, for example, how important is it for us to understand, certainly with a professional client, the language that they use and to recreate that language in our own website. Yes, yeah, so that's very, that's the whole thing about speaking your ideal client's language. Um, it's mm -hmm. very important. So for example, um, every time I ever write website copy for a client, I always interview their past clients and have a conversation with them. Um, I trans record those conversations. I then transcribe them and I see the types of words that they're using. You know, um, they're not going to be using overly comp a lot of the time architectural language, but they're just talking about their problems, talking about mm -hmm. why they, they hired that particular firm. Um, so speaking your ideal client's language is very important and it's very easy to kind of slip into that professional, you know, kind of buttoned up language because you feel, you know, you're writing for the public, but at the same time yep. just goes back to that ideal client. Um in, in terms of how we develop credibility with our with our with our clients, for, from your side in copywriting, what are the keys to creating copy uh, credibility? Yes, yeah, so there's many different layers. I think, um, for example, you might have um, you know a trusted by section on your homepage where you can put and this obviously is going to depend on what type of architecture firm you run or you work for mm -hmm. um, but you might have the logos of um, you know media publications you've been featured in or um, it could be the logo of, if you're a, in commercial world of big clients you've worked for um, so that's one way another way is um, of course testimonials I'm a big big fan as you can probably tell, mm -hmm. but that adds credibility because you're not the one saying it, you're letting someone else brag on your behalf. Um, and then things like awards, I always get very <laughs> hesitant mentioning that because I've seen just a lot. We, we have to remember your ideal client is most likely not an architect. They don't know the difference between the local timber award versus the Pritzker prize, you know, they don't. <laughs> so like to them, cool like but it does it it signals create you know credibility if you see someone's won an award um but i always yeah. say don't lead with that you know there's a lot of other things you're better off leading with but yeah and i think just having yeah good words and nice visuals that all adds to the, the credibility of who you are and your website so you've mentioned testimonials a number of times i'm a big i'm with you on this one i think it's like one of the most important things that you can do in any profession is just have as many testimonials all the time however getting a good testimonial is not always the easiest thing or sometimes sometimes I'll, for example i find you know a client might say something really wonderful not in a nonchalant manner or say it to you face to face and then you ask them to could you say that in writing for me? Or could you say that again? And then you get back, you know, the client goes through their own way of becoming all sort of professional and <laughs> they've taken their personality out of the testimonial. How, how do you recommend that architects go about getting really good, heartfelt, 
amazing testimonials that are, you know, are, are really insightful. What's the, what's the art to doing this? Yeah, so I've actually written a whole uh, handbook on this. <laughs> um, uh -huh. um, and yeah, so the thing with testimonials is very much, even before you go into the what you're going to ask them and how you're going to get it, is when you're going to ask them. And with architecture projects, a lot of people wait till the end or um, of a project to ask, but you almost need to set reminders in your calendar as to when you're hitting milestones or, as you said, if a client just off, you know, off the cuff says, oh, I'm really happy, that's when you have to strike. So a lot of it to get the gold is when you're asking. Um, but then following on how to ask, it really depends on the situation of the person. So just for example, if, if I was in your situation and someone said something really nice to me, if you know they've got a tendency to write in a professional way, what I would do is I would just mock up something for them and just say, hey, you just said this on our conversation. Would you mind if I use it as a testimonial? Um, so always ask for their approval. But if you write it for them, just based on your memory, then A, like number one, it saves time back and forth and also their brain power. And they're more likely just to be like, yeah, that's fine. Or just make a little bit of an edit here and yeah, go for it. So you just want to make it as easy as you can for them. Um, mm -hmm. Also in the guidebook, like, for example, I've written a list of questions um, that you can ask, just really basic questions. You can either send them via email or just pick up the phone. Um, or something that also is often underutilized is um, taking a screenshot or a screen grab and putting that perhaps depends on what your website looks like, but, you know, in, in an email or on social media because screenshots are very credible because it's like nothing's been touched, nothing's been edited. This is just what someone said to you. So mm. I find them extremely powerful. So if someone sends you an email saying, we're so happy, um, here are some images of the, the morning light coming into our kitchen, use that, screen grab that and put it up somewhere. Um, because that's a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a great idea. That's because it's really authentic. Yeah. And th those, those little moments, which are, you know, there's no, there's no, it's not trying to be anything else except for just that's a kind it. of, you know, a, a grateful response. Um, exactly. and, and, and in terms of like, uh, help making it easy for somebody to write a testimony, because often that can be the other problem with, with having a testimonial is that if you were just to say to a client, can you please write me a testimonial? And then they're like, yeah, absolutely. Of course. Sure. And then crickets. And then you might send a message again and they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. No, I definitely want to do it. But actually when we think about it from their side, it's quite a big undertaking. It might take 30 minutes. They might think it's going to take 30 minutes and they're like, oh, I really want to do this and da, 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 da. And oft, often I find with other business owners, they're much better because then you, there's a kind of common, you know, I appreciate when people write about my business, so I'm going to take the time. But perhaps with a residential client, they might not see that. So how can we make it really, really easy for the, for the other person? Do, do you suggest like a, a pre-structured questionnaire to help structure their thoughts or... <laughs> Yeah, so I have, I think I have about six questions that I always ask um, okay. in an email. So, yeah, that's in the guidebook. But you just say, like, you know, those six questions. And you always, the thing with um, testimonials, you need to, again, this is copywriting, right? It's psychology. You need to say to someone, hey, I really enjoyed working with you. I'd love to work with more clients like you. You know, you want to stroke their ego a little bit. Um, you are in the best position to help me answer some of these questions because we've just finished project X, Y, Z. Do you mind taking, you know, tell them, you know, five minutes to answer the questions below. So make it very clear, make them understand why you're asking them um, because, you know, they're in the best position. Tell them how long it's going to take. Um, and also when those questions, I would always just give them a few prompts. I mean, I hate it. Like in all honesty, I find writing a, a testimonial from with nothing to go off quite you know, overwhelming and daunting. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure yeah. they're even the same. Um, but with testimonials really at the end of the day, the, the basic, um, you know, formula is point A to point B. Where was that client? What were they struggling with? So you tell them, you know, what, what, where were you? What was happening in your home? Were you outgrowing your home? What was happening? Um, and then point B, after working with us, where did you end up? What's your life like now? You just want to show that transformation um, mm -hmm. because a prospective client reading that will say, okay, wow, they've gone from here to here. That's where I want to get. I'm here now. I want to get to point B. So, yeah. 
Amazing. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to to conclude the, the conversation. That's been an absolute stonker of the last 40 minutes or so with loads of brilliant um, resources and advice. If people want to get hold or um, d- dive deeper into some of the resources that you've been mentioning here, like the testimonial handbook, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, to, I would say jump on my email list, um, which you can do on my website, but I give all, away all my best stuff there. So, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll put all the information in the link in the information to this podcast. Nikita, thank you so much. That's been incredibly insightful, uh, deep dive into uh, copywriting for architecture websites. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.